Uh, all right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, today, uh, I'll be talking about the BEX and the BEX Hub, a centralized repository that aims to make BEX more accessible and practical for everyone. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, I'll provide an overview of BEX first, then discuss several challenges we face with its adoption. And finally, I'll uh, present our solution to these challenges. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Tepe Fukuder, uh, working at Aqua Security as an open source engineer. Uh, I started to trivia in my spare time. Uh, it's an open source security scanner, mainly for vulnerabilities and the misconfigurations. And now I luckily maintain trivia as part of my job. So I'd be really happy if any of you have ever heard of Trivi. So <clears throat> uh, let's get started. So, uh, over the past decade, uh, we've seen 460% increase uh, in the number of vulnerabilities, CVEs, uh, published uh, annually. And uh, log4share, SBOM, supply chain, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's enough. So, I think uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this story and uh, trend. So, I don't want to waste your time repeating that. So. What matters here is we need effective and efficient vulnerability management. So it involves uh, multiple steps. So let me walk you through these steps to understand how uh, the workflow is going. So it starts uh, with a lot of vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, like uh, 12,000 or 30,000 vulnerabilities annually. Uh, but here's the good news. We, you don't have to look at all of them. So the first step is uh, detecting which vulnerabilities are actually affecting your systems or assets. So we can use SBOMs, uh, SCA tools, or security scanners to help with this process. And the next comes the uh, initial risk assessment. Uh, it can be automated by using CBSS metrics, like uh, CBSS scores, vectors, and the severities and the newer metrics like EPS scores. Uh, ideally, we should fix all vulnerabilities immediately, but it's not practical. So we do prioritize. We filter out negligible vulnerabilities, then fix them later. So the last step is uh, uh, threat and uh, asset-based risk assessment. While frameworks like uh, SSBC can help, uh, this step often requires human judgment. We have to answer questions like, uh, is this system internet facing? Uh, does this system have access to personal information? Uh, how does this vulnerability affect our systems? And uh, can we even accept this risk? So it's challenging to automate. So it means it takes more time than the previous steps. Uh, as we are uh, also high risk vulnerabilities that uh, remain at the end requires emergency fixes, like uh, out of schedule fixes, which means even more time spent uh, on like uh, testing and a deployment. So as we move to the right on this workflow, each step takes more time and resources. So reducing the number of vulnerabilities that reach these later stages a significantly decrease overall workload of the vulnerability management. I'm just saying shifting left in this workflow is essential. So I mentioned using uh, S-bombs and security scanners to detect the vulnerabilities affecting our systems. But here's an important caveat. So detected vulnerabilities might not actually be exploitable. Uh, I can share some common scenarios First, uh, there are cases where CBID was assigned, but it turned out to be incorrect and there wasn't actually a vulnerability. The second, there are vulnerabilities that only affect systems under specific configurations. The third, like we depend on a vulnerable package, but the vulnerable code is never called in our application. So it means exploitable, now detected vulnerabilities does not always equal exploitable vulnerabilities. Uh, here's a real world example. Uh, a vulnerability uh, was disclosed, found in an NPM package, and also CBID was assigned. 
but it, after the maintainer looked into it, it was later determined to be incorrect, and the security advisory also has been revoked. But this vulnerability still remains in the National Vulnerability Database, NVD, and some other advisory databases. So which means the security scanners still might flag it as a security issue. And uh, here's another example from Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was using the vulnerable version of the Docker distribution, which is a Go module, Go package library. But the vulnerable code was not included in Kubernetes. So it means it's not uh, exploitable, attackable, even though security scanners would detect this issue. So research said only 3% of open source vulnerabilities are actually attackable or exploitable. Also, this report mentioned while many systems were using the vulnerable version of log4j, 96% of them were actually not affected by log4j. Also, another research shows that uh, many packages installed in container images uh, are not loaded at, at runtime, at, not used at runtime. <clears throat> so this tells us something important. Just depending on a vulnerable dependency, vulnerable package doesn't necessarily mean your system is vulnerable. So, but uh, please don't blame SBOMs and uh, SCA tools. Uh, they've improved the vis vulnerability visibility for sure. And now we are simply ready to move to the next stage. So let me explain reachability with a simple example. Uh, let's take a look at two software products. Uh, in the first case, the software A depends on component C, which calls the vulnerable function E1 in the component E. In this case, yes, it's actually vulnerable because there's a clear path to the vulnerable code. So now let's take a look at software B. Uh, in this case, the software B depends on component D. But this component D never calls the vulnerable function E1. It calls the function E1 in the component E. So in this scenario, even though software B is using the same vulnerable component E, it's not exploitable. Yeah, this shows us that the vulnerability reachability is not just about uh, what components you use. It's about uh, how we use the components. So the relationship between the parent components and uh, their dependencies determines whether a vulnerability is indeed exploitable, reachable. So let me go back to the diagram I showed earlier. If we can evaluate exploitability before assessing vulnerabilities deeply, we can significantly reduce the number of vulnerabilities <coughs> that need to be assessed in the subsequent steps. So as you can see, we have much less input flowing into the time-consuming steps that assess vulnerabilities. So ideally, we want to reduce 97% vulnerabilities like in the research report. But even a small, smaller reduction in noise can make a great impact on the vulnerability management efficiency. So <clears throat> how do we express the exploitability information? And that's exactly where BEX comes in. Uh, BEX is originally from NTIA, and uh, it can uh, describe whether a product is actually affected by a specific vulnerability. Uh, as we saw in the Kubernetes example, uh, software maintainers might have analyzed the source code and evaluated reachability. However, that information often exists only on GitHub issues or uh, in documents or blog posts. So it's hard to automate. But since BEX provides this information in a machine readable format like uh, JSON, we can automatically consume that in our workflows. So BEX document uh, consists of multiple BEX statements, and the BEX statement uh, is composed of three key elements, vulnerability, product, and uh, status. So BEX is idea, like a concept. So there are four implementations, as far as I know. So CSAF, 
SPDX, CycroneDX, and uh, OpenBEX. The wire OpenBEX uh, is uh, specifically designed for BEX, as a format implement BEX as a part of their profiles. For example, the SPDX and the CycroneDX are also known for SBOM, and the CSAF can be used as a security advisory. Uh, let me break down uh, OpenBEX example. So, as I said, uh, the statement has three components. The first is a vulnerability, uh, which can be expressed by identifiers like CBIDs. The second is a product. There are several standards uh, for representing software, but OpenBEX recommends using a package URL. Uh, it's uh, identifiers for uh, pack software packages, uh, consisting of a package ecosystem type, like a Golang, NPM, uh, RPM, also package namespace, the package name, like Kubernetes, and the version. And the third is the status, uh, which can be affected, uh, not affected, fixed, and under investigation in OpenBEX. Uh, other formats have different sets of the statuses. In this example, we are looking at uh, OpenBEX statement about Kubernetes and its subcomponent Docker distribution. So the status is not set to not affected, which means Kubernetes is using the vulnerable version of the Docker distribution, but uh, it's not affected by this vulnerability in this specific context. So this context really matters because the Docker distribution itself has a vulnerability, actually. But in this context of Kubernetes, the vulnerability doesn't affect. So the context or relationship really matters in BEX. So this is a typical uh, way to use uh, BEX in our workflows. First, uh, we detect vulnerabilities uh, affecting our assets, as I said, by checking vulnerability databases against uh, asset information like uh, SBOM. Then we reflect the statuses from BEX statements to filter out non-exploitable vulnerabilities. This way, we only output the vulnerabilities that are indeed exploitable. So who can BEX? So who can issue BEX statements? The answer is simple. Uh, anybody can BEX. So uh, there are various stakeholders in supply chain, software supply chain, and uh, they can issue BEX statements for their own specific reasons. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. Let's say uh, vulnerability is found in RANSI and the Kubernetes depends on RANSI, so the Kubernetes maintainers review the source code and find that Kubernetes is not calling any of the vulnerable functions in RANSI. In this case, the Kubernetes maintainers probably BEX Kubernetes. I mean, issue BEX statements for Kubernetes, declaring Kubernetes as not affected. But it doesn't stop there. Like, uh, for example, Red Hat, as a Kubernetes distributor, analyzes uh, their product and determines that their product is not affected by this vulnerability because the vulnerable, the vulnerable functionality is not enabled in their product, for example. So yes, in this case, Red Hat can back Kubernetes. Also, even end user uh, finds like uh, their usage is not affected by this vulnerability, then they can back Kubernetes. But in, in this case, probably they want to keep it internal to their organization because they are end user. It doesn't make sense to publish BEX documents, BEX statements. Uh, also, security researchers, like a third party vendors, researchers, uh, look into the Kubernetes source code and uh, discover that uh, Kubernetes is not uh, using RANSI in a vulnerable way, so they can BEX Kubernetes. So anybody, anyone can BEX and they can BEX any products. So BEX workflow might sound straightforward. First, it BEX is generated for a specific product, then distributed, 
discovered by users, and finally apply to the detected vulnerabilities to get the final output. Yeah, it sounds straightforward, but in practice, there are challenge, have several challenges we have to address. So one of the major challenges is about distribution and discovery. So actually, there are some more challenges in VEX generation and the VEX application, but in this talk, I will be focusing on the distribution and the discovery programs. So currently, there is no standard for VEX distribution, which makes it difficult to share VEX documents effectively. We might be able to use the OCI referrals you know, for VEX distribution in OCI registry for container images or uh, OCI artifacts, but other types of software face this challenge. So without the standardized distribution methods, users struggle to find, discover the relevant VEX documents because they simply don't know where to look. So, and the Trivi uh, vulnerability scanner I maintain uh, supports VEX through the dash dash VEX CLI flag, which takes a local file pass to the VEX document uh, to filter out vulnerabilities. And also some other scanners are doing something similar. But to be honest, it's not practical because users need to find, download, and provide VEX documents to the scanner themselves. But if your project has more than, let's say, 100, 100 dependencies, which is quite common, how do you find all the relevant VEX documents? No, it's impossible to manually track down all of them. So this brings us to a crucial point. To make VEX truly practical, we have to automate both the distribution and the discovery, discovery processes. So, yeah, VEX Hub. Uh, yeah, this is uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, we created VEX Hub to address uh, the problems I just explained. Uh, VEX Hub is a simple GitHub repository where VEX documents are stored. <coughs> uh, when the software maintainers uh, publish VEX documents, they are automatically collected and stored in VEX Hub. It creates two benefits. Like software maintainers can easily distribute VEX documents through VEX Hub. And also users can easily discover VEX documents from a centralized location. So VEX Hub makes it possible to automate VEX discovery. Uh, we've already implemented this automatic VEX discovery in Trivi. Uh, you can enable it using dash dash VEX repo CLI flag. Then during the vulnerability scanning, Trivi automatically tries to find relevant VEX documents from VEX Hub and apply them to the detected vulnerabilities. So in this example, uh, when Trivi is scanning a container image, to be found uh, binary, built by Go, and also found, found a VEX document from VEX Hub. Then suppress vulnerabilities accordingly, as you can see. So it said the suppressed vulnerabilities. This vulnerability was detected, but uh, suppressed because of the VEX from Aqua VEX Hub. So you don't have to look for VEX documents. So yeah, Trivi does. And this is an example of how VEX Hub can be used in practice uh, when the source code is built into the software artifacts like binaries or container images. Uh, security scanners are often required to scan these artifacts without access to the original source code. It's not easy to analyze exploitability from the built artifacts, you know, from the binaries. Uh, I know there are some researches regarding that, but it's not easy. So this is where our solution comes in. When, uh, during the build process, we can use static analysis tools like SAST to generate VEX. 
Uh, for example, Go has a tool called uh, Go button check that builds a uh, core graph and evaluates uh, exploitability. And that tool also supports generating VEX. So then these VEX documents are published to VEX Hub. And when security scanners examine the software artifacts, they automatically discover and utilize VEX documents from Aqua VEX Hub. <clears throat> And I can show you uh, how Bex Hub collects Bex documents. And behind the scenes, uh, Bex Hub has a crawler. And its configuration is uh, managed in a GitHub repository. To collect Bex documents for a specific product, we add its package URL to the crawler configuration. And in this example, you can see uh, three packages in this configuration. Yeah, actually the configuration has a list of packages to collect the VEX documents. So yeah, in this case, Crawler tries to collect VEX documents for these three packages. Next, uh, the Crawler tries to resolve the source repository URL from the package URL. Because the package URL is uh, describing where this package is distributed but it doesn't mention where this package is developed or where this package is built. Yeah, as you can see this, uh, in this example, npm package URL just sets Angular animations. So we don't know where this package is uh, developed. So once the crawler gets the source repository URL, uh, it looks for BEX files under the .bex directory of the source repository URL. When the crawler finds the BEX documents, BEX files, it stores BEX files in Aqua BEX Hub. And this entire process runs you know, periodically, ensuring Aqua BEX Hub always has up-to-date BEX documents. So software maintainers uh, don't have to notify Aqua BEX Hub about updates. Uh, all they have to do is create Bex documents and they store that uh, in the .bex directory of their source repository. So if you are a maintainer of any open source repository, so please consider publishing Bex documents. It helps a lot of users with uh, vulnerability handling. So this is an example of how a uh, repository resolution works. Uh, in this example, uh, with the NPM package, Angular Animations, uh, looking at the bottom right of the slide, uh, you can see the repository information that re uh, the crawler retrieves from the NPM registry API. So in this example, it resolves to github.com Angular Angular. So it's just a resolution from Angular Animations, N NPM package name to the GitHub repository URL. Once the crawler gets a repository URL, it crawls BEX files under the .bex directory. This is an example from Trebiz repository. As you can see, there is a .bex directory at the root of the GitHub repository containing several BEX files. These BEX files are collected by the crawler and stored in BEX hub, like a copy into the uh, Bex Hub. <clears throat> so I should mention uh, we proposed this idea, the use of the .bex directory to the open Bex project from OpenSSF. But uh, this is still under discussion, so the future implementation might change based on this ongoing discussion. So I said anybody can Bex. Anybody can vex any product. So, for example, while I'm not a Kubernetes maintainer, but I can vex Kubernetes. You can vex Kubernetes. Anybody can vex Kubernetes. So this naturally raises an important question. So which vex should be trusted? So in Aqua Vex Hub, uh, we've implemented a trust model based on the maintainer authority. It means Aqua Bex Hub accepts Bex documents for Kubernetes that are issued by Kubernetes maintainers. 
So BEX documents that I issue or you issue wouldn't be accepted. Also BEX from third parties will be rejected. BEX documents uh, under the .bex directory have been added by project maintainers or accepted through pull requests they have reviewed. So it gives us confidence that these BEX documents represent the maintainer's uh, official position. But what if users want to trust BEX documents, BEX statements from third parties uh, more than ones uh, issued by project maintainers? Yeah, actually it makes sense. For example, uh, when a smaller project maintainer who is not familiar with security doesn't publish BEX or uh, even publishes uh, wrong BEX. Yes, in this case, you might want to trust BEX from third parties. To address this need for flexibility, we define the BEX repository specification, uh, which, allows you, which allows anyone to publish their own BEX repository. So this spec is uh, quite simple, you know, consisting of three components. First is a manifest file containing metadata about the repository and the index file that maps the package IDs to the corresponding VEX locations, VEX file locations. And third, the collection of VEX documents. Also, distribution is very straightforward. Uh, you host the manifest file on the server and you archive index file and the VEX documents into a single archive file, like a Taji zip. Then distribute it, that's it. So Aqua Bex Hub follows this Bex repository specification, meaning just uh, one of the implementations uh, for this spec. And any repository, uh, Trivi supports any Bex repository that implements this Bex repository specification. So it means you can choose whose Bex you trust. Uh, whether that's from project maintainers, or big tech companies, or security researchers, third parties. So you can choose. Uh, <coughs> there are the examples of a manifest file and the index file. Uh, manifest file contains uh, metadata like repository name, description, uh, a list of supported versions, and the locations of archive files. Yeah, so simple. And the index file contains a mapping between package IDs and the corresponding BEX file locations. So BEX file locations are currently uh, relative file paths within the archive file. This structure allows you to, uh, allows security scanners to be efficient because security scanners first read the index file and load only necessary BEX files. So for example, if your project is not using NPM package, there's no reason security scanners load BEX files regarding NPM packages. So yeah, I'm really honored to share that Rancher published their own BEX repository since uh, Rancher BEX Hub. So this Rancher BEX Hub, uh, follows, implements the specification I just explained, it's already compatible with Trivi and any security scanners that support BEX repositories. So for example, uh, this repository distributes a BEX document for Kubernetes. But this BEX is not from Kubernetes maintainers. So Aqua BEX Hub will not accept this BEX document, but still, Susa Rancher can distribute this BEX in their own BEX repository. This is, you know, the, one of the biggest benefits of the BEX repository specification I explained. So you can see there are required components, uh, manifest file, index file, and the BEX documents. It's a simple GitHub repository. Uh, Trivi uh, allows you to configure multiple repositories with priorities. So for example, you can set Rancher Bex Hub as primary and uh, set Aqua Bex Hub as secondary. So 
when a BEX file for a specific product is not found in the primary repository, then Trivi falls back into the secondary repository. So if you have uh, like more than two repositories, so Trivi falls back until the BEX document is found. So you can also configure it the other way around. Set a BEX sub primary, Rancher BEX sub secondary, or you can choose to use only Rancher BEX sub. It's totally up to you. So any BEX repository that follows the specification I just explained can be used to Ruby and uh, any scanners that support uh, BEX repositories. Uh, yes, all right. So since uh, we are seriously, we've been seriously trying to reduce noise in vulnerability detection so for a long time. So I'm truly happy to be here today talking about our solution, BEX Hub and the BEX repository specification. So anybody can publish their own BEX repository and also anybody can, and any security scanners can consume these BEX repositories. So uh, I hope they will help make the world a little more secure. So yeah, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so you said you guys use third party security personnel to verify the VEX uh, documents, I guess. Is that the case? Um, yeah. You mean you are talking about the VEX? Repository from third parties? Uh, I guess, so a, I'm a vendor and I send, you know, I say, here's my VEX um, docu documentation, whatever you want to call it, and you're saying someone else verifies that after a vendor has sent it in, or is it, is it purely trust? Uh, so you, sorry, you mean the, you, as the, third party security vendors or any other, as, third, as third parties, you, are, you want to publish the BEX repository, right? So. Yeah, basically you, you wanna say, I guess you wanna, you know, if I use BEX, I wanna know that the you, data you that mean I'm the getting. Use BEX mean the publishing BEX or consuming BEX? Consuming so, it. Consuming BEX, ah, yeah. okay. So uh, yeah, you can just uh, like uh, configure like a uh, BEX repository, like a Trivi, for example, Trivi has a configuration file yeah. And uh, you can point to any BEX repository uh, however you want. So just uh, like uh, if, I don't know, let's say, uh, I don't know, Red Hat published the BEX repository, then you can configure it to the point to that BEX repository. Okay. Yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, how do I know that Red Hat isn't making up yeah, things? Yeah, uh, maybe I will, we needed to make a list of the VEX repository, I don't know, like index or something, maybe we have to make, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, okay. for now, we don't have it, so, because it's, it's uh, launched a few months ago, so only now Rancher is uh, uh, publishing their VEX repository, so okay. now only two repositories, so, okay. yeah. But hopefully, it will be expanding, yeah. Thank you. Hey. Um, Nice presentation. We produce our VEX data. So my question is that the VEX repository specification that you just mentioned, is it under any open source like organization? Like what's the governance behind it? Yeah, actually now uh, we at Aqua Security defined this specification, uh, but we are trying to make it transparent and vendor neutral so anybody can use it. Actually it's uh, in, on GitHub. So any repository, any specification is public. So. But if possible, we want to, you know, donate this back to like uh, OpenSSF or uh, something. But uh, I'm not sure. So now, for now, it's defined by our company, Aqua Security. Yes. Thank so you. So that was kind of my question, and it was not necessarily a question, but a request. I would request that Aqua Security donate the VEX repo specification and VEX Hub to OpenSSF so that OpenSSF could run VEX Hub as a public good instance, just like they do with other sources of information essential for software supply chain security. Yeah, so that's the uh, you know, best so idea, yeah. So hopefully, but I'm not sure, like uh, we were supposed to have a chat with uh, Open 
back SIG, but uh, we didn't have a chance so far. Okay. So maybe after this I'll follow event, up with you yeah. later. Thank yeah, you. thank you. <clears throat> if I wanted to uh, implement VEX Hub support into a tool I maintain, is there any sort of libraries or anything to support that, or would it all be writing it from scratch? That's right. I was not following. So could you repeat it? Uh, if I wanted to add VEX Hub support to a, a, a tool I maintain or a product I maintain, is there any sort of like tooling or libraries to help with that, uh, or is it I would have to? Ah, uh, yeah. Myself? For now, we don't have it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so for now, just there is a just a specification, and uh, but yeah, actually, it makes sense. Yeah, maybe we probably make uh, you know. GitHub organization to like, help with uh, implement uh, like uh, consuming Vex repository or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was going to suggest some, you know, some yeah, sort of collaboration actually, for like, you know, idea. go yeah. open Vex, Python open Vex. You know, different uh, yeah, actually, the open Vex have uh, one repository, like uh, open Vex discovery repository. Okay. And uh, I was trying to add support for Vex repository in that uh, library. But uh, yeah, so far we didn't have a chance. So probably uh, we were working together to yeah, add that support, yeah. Hi, thank you, excellent work. Um, I had a question about VEX Hub. Uh, it seems like an excellent source, but it's only going to be as good as it is as good data. So knowing that it's still new, how complete is the data in there? Do you have a lot of data or a little bit of data? Or how are you going to get it fully populated with as much data as possible? Mm, sorry, could you elaborate on that? So if, if VEX Hub only has a handful of, of VEX documents in there, it's only going to be very limited in its usability, mm -hmm. right, of trying yes. to build secure software. So yeah. my question is, how, how big is your data set already? Is it already uh, usable for the average company to start adopting? Or is this sort of a, hey, this may only get 1% of the software you're using? Yeah, so you mean the current Vex Hub has a, like a small set of the Vex documents? So yes. But uh, you mean? How, yes, my question is how, how big is the data set that Vex Hub has today? Yeah, so for now, we just need to promote Vex itself. And uh, if the software maintainers publish Vex documents, it mm -hmm. helps a lot of you know, users with the vulnerability handling. So mm -hmm. we just needed to say, please publish Vex documents. Okay. And uh, yeah, for now. Actually, Vex itself is not so popular no. as of today. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, CISA is also working on Vex, and also OpenSSF is trying to promote Vex. So, yeah, now, uh, hopefully, uh, after a few years, uh, okay. most uh, open source projects. Uh, so, Vex, Vex Hub is a little more aspirational at the moment than it is usable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your work. Yeah, thank you.